Manfred Goldberg, born in April 1930 in a town called Kassel in Germany, where I lived with my parents and a younger brother until we were deported and taken to the camps where I spent several years. Post-war, as a survivor, I came to England where I, I sort of managed to catch up on my education. Eventually I went to university, took a degree, and I worked in the electronics industry for some years, and then changed careers and worked for the rest of my working life in the property field. I am now retired, happily retired, very happily married, father of four lovely sons, we don't normally specify the number of grandchildren, but it runs into two digits, and each one of them is a gem. And two of them are here with me this morning. I'm delighted to have their company, always, any time. And I look forward to uh, having a conversation with both of them. When I was asked whether I would be prepared to take part in producing a film record on this project, Generation to Generation, on reflection, it seemed a brilliant way to perpetuate and present and record, keep for future generations, a record of the calamity that befell our people a mere 70 years ago. I would be interested to hear from you directly why you think it important. I'm aware that you've been interviewed by other Holocaust survivors and people of your own age, but I think an interview in this format with a grandchild interviewing a grandparent will be very accessible to the younger generation and it will educate people for future generations to come. Have you any idea, Hanania? Um, I, th I thought this was important so that we could pass the story on to future, to my children and grandchildren, pass it on, so it's never forgotten. That's precisely my feeling, and there's not a more personal way of doing it than to have grandchildren wanting to hear the experiences of, of their grandparent, who was one of the very, very few fortunate survivors. So please go ahead and... Uh, Tell me what you would like to find out. You were born in Kassel in Germany on April 21st, 1930. Your parents were Rosanie Seaman and Benno Goldberg. Your father had been born in Olpany in Poland, but had run away to Germany to avoid conscription. He never saw his parents or siblings again. Your mother was born in Prohinsko in Poland, had come yeah. to Kassel on a visit and was introduced to your father. Your brother Hermie was born on July 11th, 1934. Saba, can you tell us a bit about your life, your childhood life before the war? Well, I was a little boy at the time. I do remember certain events quite clearly. One incident, which was rather gruesome, I do remember. My father had taken me for a walk in town and we suddenly came across an enormous conglomeration of people who seemed to be waiting for something. And then we couldn't get through, we couldn't walk along the pavement for people, it was completely blocked. And we were told that Hitler was actually visiting Kassel. We had to stop and pretend to be part of the crowd who were awaiting enthusiastically the arrival of Hitler. Eventually, a cavalcade of motor cars came along and I remember my father, Oliver Scholem, having to raise his hand in the Heil Hitler salute to be part of the crowd, because had he not done so, he would have been noticed and that would not have been good. This was probably around 1937, 38, I must have been seven years old. But that sticks in my mind quite clearly. I, I can picture it to this day. We, we lived in an apartment my father ran a textile business. Initially he had a, a retail business, but um, the Germans stopped Jewish retail 
uh, business by forbidding non-Jews to enter their shops. And therefore he continued running the business from home because there were still non-Jewish people who were so uh, impressed by his honesty and value for money that they would take a chance and come to the house to be served by him privately and sort of unobtrusively despite the official ban on dealing with Jewish people. Can you tell me about your school life? Yes. In our town there were around 5,000 Jews in a population of about a quarter of a million people. We had a Jewish primary school in town to which I was um, registered to go and I began going, to, in, in Germany school age began at six. I started going to school at, when I was age six. Unfortunately in early 1939 the Germans decided to close down this Jewish school which meant that my schooling actually finished at the age of eight and a half. As a result of uh, later deportation of I did not have any further schooling until I came to England at the age of 16. Did you have a lot of friends in school? I had some uh, friends, one in particular, you know, at that age one often tends to pick one close friend and you become inseparable. And in fact, in this uh, booklet, there is a photograph of taking in, in a classroom and I am here, aged eight, and next to me is my best friend whose name was Sal it was actually because he's no longer alive. His name was Salomoidl. We became inseparable, both because we liked each other and uh, partly, I suppose, because his parents and my parents were also close friends, so we knew each other since we were babies. We sort of grew up together. So that, that is my schooling background. I had a lot to catch up on when I finally came to England in 1946. Can you tell us about your brother? Yes, I had a younger brother, as you know. He was born in 1934 which meant he was not old enough to go to school pre-war. When the school was closed in 1938, early 1939, he was below school age, so he never did go to school. His name was Herman, a lovely sweet boy. You can see a photograph of him. In fact, there are two. This is my little brother, and here are both of us. On, on one photo. I'm not sure how old I was here, how old he was, but probably uh, eight and four, I would guess. And here he was probably just a little older, maybe five. Slava, can you tell us about the list of dates you made in 1946 and what motivated you to write it all down? Yes, I have told you about this before. It is inexplicable. I. I I cannot tell you what motivated me, but within two or three weeks of our liberation, which was on 3rd of May 45, I sat down and jotted down, well, calling it the highlights is, is the wrong term. Um, the dates which stuck in my mind were the dates when usually worse than usual things happened in the camp. The whole time in the camp was, was sort of one long sentence of torture, but within that, the days when there was just regular routine were normal and relatively uneventful. Human nature is such that you get used to problems which recur daily, but every so often something really cruel and um, memorable happened, and those dates I jotted down made a list when I wasn't sure I spoke to sort of fellow Jews who were liberated together with me or had been in various camps with me and between us and my mother Leah Sholem also helped we compiled this list 
and apparently it's something quite rare because as I, just as I don't know what motivated me to do it, um, many other people did not do it, so it's quite rare. There were some events listed on here which apparently are not generally recorded, so it may actually be a very minor contribution to actually as a, a history of, of what happened to us in the camps. It is written in a very childish um, handwriting, in German of course, as you can see, if you look at it. I don't know whether any of this means anything to you. Look for instance here. It says, Mena Hare Geshoren. Any idea what that means? No. It means men, um, heads, uh, hair sheared off. This one here, Sträflingskleidung, means that was the date when they changed us from having our old clothes into the uh, convict clothing. You may have seen photographs of them. Yeah. The striped grey and grey and blue striped convict's uniform that was handed out to us on that date. And these dates then stuck in my mind. And the whole list um, contains mainly these events which were quite mem memorable occasions when we were transferred from one camp to another, etc. What is your earliest memory from Germany indicating that things were changing for the Jews there? Well, during the years 33 to 39, progressively more severe anti-Jewish legislation was passed and things became more and more difficult. My recollection the, the, the most vivid one is Kristallnacht, which was the 9th of November 1938. I was eight years old then. There was a major riot in town when every Jewish shop was looted. The police actually encouraged people to do it. People in the street gathered outside the shop would break in to loot the shop and then they would set it on fire. Likewise, the synagogue in which we used to pray was also vandalized and then set on fire. Seba, on Kristallnacht, you were 11, 11 years old. Um, what was, where were you and how was it? Well, on Kristallnacht, that is late 1938, our Jewish school was still open. I had attended school during the day. Incidentally, coming home from school was really um, quite uh, risky. We had been given strict instructions that if we were attacked on the way home, on no account to fight back, but to turn and run as fast as we could. And it did happen sometimes that um, non-Jewish kids were lying in wait for us and would abuse us verbally and sometimes even physically and we did as we were told just run off because if you lost your cool and fought back there could be very serious consequences even at our age we were aware of it so i, I was at home that this happened in the evening i think my mother was getting us ready for bed we could actually hear street noises outside it was a riot it wasn't just an attack on Jewish uh, property, it was a major organized national riot which happened in many towns in Germany, wherever Jews lived. Two things stand out in my memory concerning Kristallnacht. One, it, a non-Jewish policeman who lived in our building had quietly warned my father that it would be in his interest not to be around because um, that there was a risk that Jewish men would be arrested. So my father went into hiding for a number of days until it cooled down. The other consequence of Kristallnacht, which has come to mind now, is that I told you synagogues were also torched and burnt out. There was one large synagogue in our town, 
which had been burnt out and in fact the structure had become a danger so that it was on the point of collapse and it was uh, actually demolished and there was now just a heap of stones where the, sh the synagogue had been and some weeks after the Kristallnacht one morning all our school every Jewish child from that school was diverted from school taken to the site where this heap of stones was and we all had to um, help remove the rubble from the site. Trucks would turn up and we children had to throw the debris onto the back of trucks. One by one we had to throw stones. I remember it clearly because one of the boys sort of misjudged and um, sort of a, a broken brick or whatever it was instead of landing on the track, landed on my head and actually cracked my skull. Uh, and hence it became quite a, a memorable occasion for me. And apart from that, following Kristallnacht, I kept on going to school. As we all, you know, life was very tough. We were not allowed to shop in non-Jewish shops. We were not allowed, for instance, to stay on the pavement if a German soldier or SS man walked towards us in uniform we had to step off the pavement to allow him to pass before we could step back onto the pavement. It, it was demeaning for him to be passed by, by a Jew. The, that, that was the sentiment against Jews. It was quite frightening. As an 11 year old I didn't really fully understand what it all meant, but I do know that I was scared. As I said, walking home from school, or rather running home from school, was quite, quite a dangerous um, event each day. And we were considered ourselves lucky if we got home without anything happening. How did it feel to live in constant fear? It becomes a, a way of life. For instance, we were short of food because we were allowed to shop in only one shop in town that was permitted to Jews. And if that shop ran out of certain foods, we just had to do without. And there were occasions when we didn't have a scrap of bread in the house. I recall one occasion when my mother took me after school to the corner at the end of our road where there was a, a non-Jewish bakery shop opposite. We were not allowed to enter it because Jews were forbidden to enter non-Jewish shops. Um, at that time already we were wearing the yellow star with the word Jew written across it. My mother instructed me to hold my school satchel in such a way that it covered the yellow star. She gave me the correct money for a loaf of bread and we stood on the street corner watching the shop until there were no customers in the shop. Then she sent me across to quickly enter the shop, ask for a loaf of bread, put the correct money on the desk, grab the, the loaf of bread and run back to my mother. And th this was chan a chance we had to take. I assure you, my mother would not have risked my life lightly so we must have been pretty desperate for some food for her to expose me to such a risk. But uh, this is how we managed to keep going. Saba, can you tell me what happened to your father, my great-grandfather? Well, following the warning he had about Kristallnacht, he went into hiding for around two weeks. Then it felt safe for him to return, so he did. And we lived again together as a family. Um, I was still going to school. My father could not run his business really, but he was dependent on the occasional customer coming to the house still to, to buy from him. And life was not exactly normal, but it was the best we could do to keep going.
we were desperately trying to get visas to emigrate to America, the parents of my school buddy, the one I pointed out to you in the photograph, they had family living in America and managed to get visas and in late 1938 they managed to get to America. They immediately attempted to find sponsors for us to get visas to America but uh, it was not easy and nothing had materialized yet. And then early in 1939, I, I have no note and therefore no recollection of the date, there was a knock on our door and my father was arrested instantly. He had to leave with the officials who came and we were told that he was being deported to Poland. My father originally was born in Poland, but had lived in Germany for more than 20 years, had married in Germany. Both his children, that is I and my younger brother, were born in Germany. He was now arrested and initially he was put into a local jail in Kassel and we were told that he was being transferred to be sent to a concentration camp. My mother was beside herself and attempted to persuade the German authorities to release him and eventually she came to an arrangement with them. They agreed that if he had a visa to leave Germany they would allow, they would release him and allow him to leave. It was almost an impossibility to get visas at the time because every Jew in Germany was clamoring for a visa to leave Germany. We realized that our days there were numbered but she managed to achieve the impossible and managed to get not only a visa for my father but she also received a promise that within a few weeks the rest of the family would receive visas to follow him. He now had a visa to enter England. When it was presented to the German authorities they kept their promise, released him, but they made a condition he had to leave Germany within 24 hours with just one suitcase and five German marks in his pocket. That was all he was permitted to leave to take. And thus my father left Germany and did this list which I pointed out to you before. I made a note back in 1945 that my father left on the 20th of August 1939. It says Fatty nach England, father to England. And that is when he left Germany. What date were you actually deported? Well, my father left in August. <clears throat> On the 3rd of September, war was declared. Mm -hmm. um, England was now an enemy country and there was no possibility of us following my father. So my mother with two young children was trapped in Castle while my father was in England. We had one postcard from him um, confirming his arrival in the UK and that was it, that there was no further contact between England and Germany, they were now at war. The Germans allowed us to remain living in our private homes but life became increasingly difficult because of food shortages in the only shop we were allowed to shop in. The Jewish school was closed which meant that my mother now had two children at home. I had no schooling. I was not the only one. No, no Jewish child had any schooling. And we struggled on in this manner. There was no income, of course, either, because there was no business. We had to live on our savings. But I don't know how my mother managed, but uh, we, we managed to keep going. And you asked me about the date. Uh, I have a note here again, which says on the 12th of December 1941 there was a knock on our door, there were two uniformed men who entered our apartment, told my mother she had 10 minutes to pack a suitcase and then she had to accompany them with the children, which of course we did, and they walked us to the railway station where there was a huge crowd of Jews gathered it was around 1,000 people. I have since looked it up on the internet and the date is confirmed 
and the number of Jews in our transport, I think, was 1,096. There were 5,000 Jews in our town, and we were the first people to be deported, and there were just over 1,000 Jews who were at the railway station. We were packed into a passenger train, packed like sardines, and eventually we set off on a journey into the unknown. What does it feel like going on a journey where you don't know the destination or the duration? It, it was frightening. My mother, of course, was quite shocked. She was very brave and put on a brave face for the sake of the children, as did, I suppose, all the parents. Many of the parents were complete families where the husbands had not been arrested. Whole families were there, but in our case, it was just a mother and two children. We had no idea where we were being taken, nothing was told us, and we travelled in this manner for three days. I remember being really frightened, but my mother did her best to comfort us, but I expect she, she was equally scared and tried not to show it in order to calm the children. Where were you taken to? Well, we had no idea. After three days of travelling, we were told to leave the train and as we exited from the train we were lined up in a large long column. We had each had to carry our luggage so my mother had to schlep a fairly heavy suitcase and we were now under armed guard. There were armed soldiers guarding us and they told us to march. We had no idea where we were, no idea where they were taking us. We just followed directions and after about a sort of 45 minute march or walk, we entered a town. We walked through part of the town into a part of the town which had been surrounded by barbed wire. And there was just one gate through which we could enter. We were taken into this barbed wire enclosure and we found out that we were in Riga which is the um, capital of Latvia. And this was the Riga ghetto. And uh, that is where we were now housed, confined by this barbed wire enclosure. We had no choice but to obey orders. We were told to go into a house there and find ourselves a room to live in. And uh, this is what we did. Can you describe the house that you were living in? Well, this is actually quite a vivid memory, let me tell you. Because to our amazement, as we entered the house, we came into a dining room where we actually saw half-eaten plates of soup. The spoon was still in the plate, which indicated that people have lived here recently and had been disturbed in the middle of a meal and had been taken away instantly without notice. We had no idea what had gone on, no one explained to us, and we were quite puzzled and disturbed at now having to live in this house which obviously, self-evidently, belonged to another family who had lived here quite recently but we were not in a position to ask questions. We just had to do as we were told. We were lucky and managed to find ourselves a room which my mother with us two children shared. And there were something like six families in the house. And there was only one kitchen. And in the Riga ghetto, we were actually given raw food. And we had to cook one meal for ourselves. What were the living conditions like there? Well, the Germans didn't lose any time. As soon as we arrived, within a couple of days or so, they issued, I remember clearly, two proclamations. One, that any money or valuables still in our possession had to be handed in to a German office in, in the ghetto on pain of death. If anyone was found in possession of money after a certain date, they were liable to be shot for it. And the second um, um, sort of 
promulgation of the Germans was that from now on um, we were no longer to be known by our names and the following morning there was a major assembly. All of us had to assemble out in the open and in turn each one of us had to come forward and we were given a number and were told that from now on we were known by that number. Our names were no longer relevant. And that is how we were supposed to lose our identity and just become a number. It turned out we were a useful source of labour for the Germans. So you, you arrived in this house and you saw the bowl of soup and the food on the table. What do you think happened to the occupants of the house? Well, we didn't have to speculate for long because we were soon told what had happened. When the Germans occupied Riga six months before our arrival, around June, July, 41, without delay, they formed this ghetto by building the barbed wire around the old part of town. They rounded up all the tens of thousands of Jews who lived in Riga. They all had to move into the ghetto. But unlike us, who were allowed to take only one suitcase, they were allowed to take many more belongings into the ghetto. What happened then is inexplicable. Later that year, around November time, the Germans decided to liquidate the ghetto to the inhabitants and by pretending to move them into other camps, over a period of days they were lined up, marched out of the ghetto into a nearby forest it was called the Rumbula Forest on the outskirts of Riga, where the Germans, via Russian prisoners of war, apparently, had dug three enormous mass graves and more than 30,000 Latvian Jews were shot or were murdered in the forest and buried in these mass graves. And the Germans now had an empty ghetto which was being refilled with transports of Jews from Germany. And we, I believe, were transport number four or five. So when we arrived, the ghetto, which at one time had housed more than 30,000, was now almost empty. There were only about four or 5,000 Jews living there now. But after our arrival, transports came at regular intervals. More than one transport per week would arrive, each one around the same number, around 1,000. And the ghetto slowly filled up. The way we were told was really something quite extraordinary because when the Germans killed all these Latvian Jews, they allowed around 30 to live and these 30 Jews were carefully selected. They were all young, educated people who spoke German and these people, these 30 young Latvian Jews were appointed as Kapos. I don't know whether you've ever heard the expression Kapo before. It's an abbreviation of Camp Police. And they regulated sort of the smooth running of the ghetto internally. Of course, we were guarded. And believe it or not, practically all our guards were not Germans. They were Latvian Nazis. The, 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 apparently they had hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers of people who hated Jews, and the Germans found they could trust them absolutely. There were armed guards, Latvians, who guarded us. The officers were German. But th that is in fact what the background was to finding these plates of soup. They were just coming along, knocking on the door, grabbed people, schlepped them out into the forest under the pretense of taking them to another camp. and. Uh, there, they were shot and buried in these mass graves. Why did the Nazis give you numbers? It's, it's an interesting question you're asking. No one explained to us, but I think, sort of self-evidently, the objective was to dehumanize us, not to think of ourselves as individuals, but we were just one tiny number in, in a huge cog and 
It remained that way right through the years I spent in the camps. I was never ever called by anything but my number. And this applied to every single individual, and probably in most camps, if not in all camps. The Germans must have thought about it and decided that this would help to make people feel submissive. Did it work? Did people think differently? Well, people were submissive because we had no choice. We were under armed guard. The Germans organized us within days of our arrival into work groups who had to, uh, so they were marched under armed guard out into town into various factories where they had to work to help the German war effort. My mother had to work in a factory which was making uniforms for the German army. She had to assemble each morning very early, was marched out of the ghetto under armed guard, did a day's work in, in this factory, and then was marched back under armed guard into the ghetto in the evening. From the moment we arrived, the Germans began starving us. You'll find this hard to believe, but in the mornings, when we had to assemble, there was an assembly every morning. Just assembly will mean something to you because you're still in school. You have morning assemblies, so did we in the ghetto. We had to assemble each morning outside the buildings we lived in, and we were carefully counted. I mean, the Germans murdered people by the hundred, the thousand, by the million, in fact, in the end. And nevertheless, each morning we were carefully counted. And if the numbers didn't tally, uh, that there was bedlam. They counted us again and again, and people were late for work, but they would not allow anyone to go off to work until they had sorted out the numbers were what they expected them to be. And food-wise, I was telling you, you, you may be surprised, because in the mornings they gave us a chunk of bread and a cup of something that was called coffee, but it was not the coffee that, that you know. It was coffee was made for, from some um, flower. I can't remember, dandelion perhaps. Uh, it, it had the color of coffee, but didn't taste anything like coffee. We got that every morning as we were standing uh, at the assembly. And we were entitled apparently to one meal a day. And believe it or not, what they gave us was potato peel, the outer leaves of cabbages, rotten carrots. And if we were lucky, we didn't get that every day, but sometimes they would give us the heads of fish, which obviously by no means fresh by the time they reached us. And we were supposed to cook that into a broth and that was our evening meal. And my mother had to do that after returning from a day's work before we could have an evening meal. And as I mentioned to you earlier, we were packed, although the ghetto was more or less empty, when our transport arrived, they allocated a certain number of houses and a thousand people had to cram into these houses, which meant that in our house there were, I think, around six families and there was only one kitchen. So six people attempted to cook their evening meal at around the same time when people came home from work. So it was Bedlamic every evening to try and prepare a meal. But that was life in the ghetto. You mentioned your mother went to make the uniforms. What were you doing whilst she was out? Children were not required to work. My little brother and I, together with any other children in the ghetto that age, um, were just initially just roaming the streets during the day, waiting for my mother to return. I, as the older brother, had to keep an eye on my little brother, who was aged seven at the time. And every afternoon we would run to the gate, awaiting my mother's return from work, when we would be reunited. What time did she come home every day? Well, it was usually about 5.30, 6 o'clock, but it started pretty early. We had the morning assembly around 6.30 in the mornings. And then they went off to work immediately after that. How long were you there for? Well, all in all, we were in Riga for practically two years. We arrived December 41, and we were in 
Riga until August 1943. Once people started going to work, um, it became a daily routine. After a little while, you know, whatever problems you have in life, initially you feel extraordinarily downhearted, but then one tends to get used to life as it is. So it became, as I said, a daily uneventful routine. Whatever happened was expected and did happen the following day and the following day and the following day. But according to the notes I've made here, and I remember it quite clearly, it's not something one can forget. Um, after we had been there for around three months, one morning, the daily routine changed dramatically. As we were assembled, they told us that no one is to go to work, but just remain standing to attention. And back in 1945, I remember the date which I wrote down here, 28th of March. The Germans announced that as some of the work was strenuous for elderly people, they would um, give the elderly people a chance to have an easier life by sending them to another camp where the work would be physically less demanding. And the way they were doing it was as follows. We have been standing to attention for a considerable time when we were divided into groups and each group had to file into a large hall. At the end of the hall there was a raised podium on which stood an SS man and as we had to file forward in single file we each had to stop in front. He would look us up and down and then he would point either left or right, usually without saying a word to anyone. You would stand there, maybe three, four meters from him. He would look you up and down and point one way or the other. Of course, all the elderly and infirm people were pointed one way and the able-bodied. And surprisingly, both my brother and I, although we were not productive, we were not working in the camp, he pointed us in the same direction as my mother, who was able-bodied and working. And the elderly people were taken away, ostensibly, to another camp. The Germans actually gave it a name, they called it Dunamunde. Uh, that was supposedly the name of the new camp they were being taken to. In fact, it became clear quite soon after that they were taken away to be murdered the same day. Several thousand people were taken on that day and that was the first traumatic experience we had in the Riga ghetto. When did you find out they were taken to be murdered and not to another camp? Well, within a few days of this selection taking place, um, truckloads of clothing arrived in the Riga ghetto and a group of people were seconded to sort this clothing. We were told that after sorting this would be sent back to Germany for use by the German population. And extraordinarily, the sorter, one or two of the sorters actually recognized items of clothing which had been worn by members of their family who were taken away. And of course it became clear that rather than being sent to another camp, they were taken possibly to the same forest or elsewhere nearby and were told to strip before being murdered. And their clothing was actually sent back to the Riga ghetto for sorting prior to being sent back to Germany to, in their own mad way, help the German war effort. That's how it became clear to us that they were in fact murdered. I mean, I have since substantiated it by reading books about the Riga ghetto and whatever I've told you uh, appears as fact in those books. At this time when you were being selected, was there any possibility of resistance? Well, 
I think that's actually a perceptive question. I told you that 30 Latvian Jews had been spared at the time of that massacre, and they were our camp police. Now, before I tell you about resistance, I think I should mention to you that initially, I told you all the kids who were not working were just roaming the streets of the ghetto. In our group of Jews who were deported from Germany was one man who was a teacher in our Jewish primary school in Kassel. And he was a remarkable man. He organized, I believe single-handedly, uh, took the initiative and received permission to convert one room within a house in the ghetto into a sort of classroom. He made up his mind that the children who were not working had to be taken care of during the day. And he organized what is sort of ironically called a school. He was not given any implements, there were no books, no paper, no pencils, no facilities for running a school. But nevertheless, each one of us was asked to come into his school, in inverted commas, into his room, and he would divide us into various age groups, each one of which was sort of treated as a separate class. He was the only person there, and all he could do was pass on, more or less verbally, what information he could to each person. I think he realized that it was a fairly hopeless task, and eventually we spent more and more time being um, arranged as a choir. We did a lot of communal singing, and he was very musical. He, he divided us into groups, and one group would sing uh, the standard uh, nigun, the standard melody, and the second group would be harmonizing with it, and he was excellent. We'd be turned into quite a creditable choir. And that was our school in the ghetto. It kept us off the streets, we were being taken care of. And at the end of school, my brother and I would run to the gate and wait for my mother to return from work. Now, you were, you were talking about resistance. I've digressed a little. One day, I have a note here again. It says on the 30th of October, I have since checked it on the internet, and the date I found on the internet for this event, which I'm about to relate to you, on, on the internet I was out by one day apparently, it was on the 31st of October, there was turmoil suddenly outside. We were in this room and through the windows we could see there was a lot of activity, armed German soldiers with rifles cocked were running around, and it turned out that these 30 Latvian Jews, who are camp police, were being hunted by the Germans. They, start, they initially assembled them all and were marching them out of the ghetto when these Latvian Jewish police must have realized that they were being taken to be executed. And they suddenly um, started running in different directions to escape the, the German guards. The Germans spent most of the day searching for them and sort of finding them in various hideouts in the ghetto, and they were eventually all rounded up, taken away to be murdered. But the reason I'm telling you this is that we found out afterwards that these Latvian Jews were actually organizing a resistance movement within the ghetto. I was a child, I knew nothing about it, but I remember hearing the story afterwards that this Latvian group had made contact with the non-Jewish resistance outside the ghetto and had actually managed to smuggle arms into the ghetto. And unfortunately, the Germans had planted um, a stooge and information was relayed back to the Germans so they eventually realized what was happening and when they felt the time was ripe, they intervened and managed to round up and kill these Latvians. But for that uh, traitor who, who informed the Germans of what was going on, um, Riga, 
might have been a sort of replica of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, had they not been apprehended, there might well have been a, an active resistance arising in the ghetto. We as children knew nothing about it and didn't uh, take part in any of this, but there must have been members of the, the, the German transports who were aware of it, who had been taken into the Latvian Jews' confidence, but the only ones who were killed were these Latvian police. And that, of course, was the end of any resistance beyond that. This happened in October 1942. In 1943, you, were, you, you, you turned 13, which was your bar mitzvah year. Um, how, how was this recognised? Well, the, the same teacher, I remember his name, his name was Herr Herr's Mister in German, Mr. Bacher. Um, he, one day, said to me, you know, your bar mitzvah is approaching. Um, if you're willing, um, I will teach you your bar mitzvah set, well, your, your laning. I, as you probably realize, I'd stopped going to school when I was eight and a half. I didn't know what bar mitzvah is. My father wasn't around. I, I had no, ins no instruction. Jewishly, I, I was um, a, a baby, you know, eight or nine year old, although I was, in, in fact, I was approaching bar mitzvah, but I said, yes, please. And he took me under his wing and after school, um, I would stay behind and he would patiently teach me how to lane. First from a chumash, I told you that these Latvian, the Riga Jews were allowed to take many things into the camp, unlike us. And many of them were from people, religious people, and they took in Sidurim, Chumoshim, and even Sifre Torah. They were all left behind because, as I told you, they were taken out at an instant notice. So we found all these various clay Kurdish in, in the camp. So he taught me to lane, and he was a remarkable man. He had the patience to teach me the whole sedra. And eventually, when my bar mitzvah um, day arrived, Ten people turned up. I don't know how they managed not to go to work because we were working seven days a week. But on, on that Shabbat, there was actually a minyan. And that was the only minyan in almost four years I was in the camps. I had never experienced any religious activity either before or after. But on that day, I laid the whole sidra and I was called up as well. I had an aliyah, and he taught me mafteh as well. I learned the mafteh, that, that was my uh, call up, Pausha. And, well, I, I can tell you, unlike today, uh, that there was no kiddush following the bar mitzvah. <laughs> but it, it um, was um, a very, very memorable experience for me. Incidentally, you, your dad decided one day to check and he looked into one of those perpetual calendars and he found that he had in fact taught me the wrong sedra. But of course we had no luach, no calendar in the camp. We had been deported in 41, this was now 43. So he had to calculate everything in, in his head. And uh, I don't know, perhaps it was a leap year, I didn't check and uh, he was three weeks out. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a bar mitzvah, and it was, as I said, the only religious experience I had in the camps. Incidentally, we were deported from the Riga ghetto in August 1943, and at a later date, when we, each time when we were deported from one camp to another, we had to assemble at some railway station, and on one occasion, we were standing at the platform waiting for our transport to arrive and on the other side a couple of, um, sort of, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word, a couple of lines away was another group of Jews and I saw my teacher, Herr Bacher, uh, waiting there with this group and he spotted me and I spotted him and we sort of waved to each other. <laughs> 
and that was the last time I saw him alive. I made inquiries after the war, after we were liberated, uh, and I could not find any trace of survival. I think he, he was eventually killed in the camps. So uh, what was your next journey after the Riga ghetto? Well, I think I told you before, Elisheva, that we were in Riga until August 1943. By then, I think the Russians were beginning to defeat the Germans on the Eastern Front, and the Germans didn't want to lose this valuable source of slave labor. So they began evacuating the camps in the east, of which Riga was one, and we were the first group to be sent on from Riga ghetto to another camp. One morning when we were doing this morning assembly, which was still going on, it was a daily occurrence throughout our stay, 2,000 of us were separated, including my mother and my younger brother, and the rest was later sent out to work. We, 2,000, had to stay behind, and we were marched out of the camp to a railway siding. Eventually, a train arrived. Incidentally, it was unlike the train which brought us to Riga, which was a passenger train. This train was cattle trucks. And every journey we made from then on was in cattle trucks. We were herded into these trucks, 2,000 of us. We were packed like sardines. That there were no toilet facilities on board, of course. There was a bucket in each of the cattle trucks. And we set off into a second journey into the unknown. No one told us what the intention was, where we were being taken. We had no idea what our fate would be, and we traveled. I have a note here, which I, I, I remembered it at the time, but I have no date. All it says was we were sent to another labor camp called Prechu, at which we arrived. I seem to remember we traveled for two days. When the doors were opened, we were told to get out, and under guard, we were marched into this next camp, which was totally different from the Riga ghetto. It was a purpose-built labor camp. It was a barbed wire enclosure within which they had built wooden, quite primitive wooden barracks. And in these barracks were um, bunk beds, three high, and this is how we were housed. As soon as we arrived, we were sorted into work groups and we all had to go to work. I was then aged 13 and unlike the Riga ghetto where I stayed in the ghetto and didn't have to work, here I did work, but my younger brother, who was now four, still four years younger, he was nine, he was allowed to stay in the ghetto and there were a handful, I think four altogether, little ones, who stayed in the camp and everyone else had to go to work. The whole purpose of existence of this labor camp was labor. The Germans exploited us by using us as slave labor. They had built various factories nearby and we were marched into these factories. In fact, our group was not, but the majority of people, we were around 10,000 people in this camp of whom so more than nine and a half thousand were working in factories. And we, that is a group of around 300, we were taken to the railway lines, which were nearby, to work on railway repair. Um, what work did you have to do in the camp? Well, these railway lines I mentioned were the result of Allied air raids by 1943, the Allies had decided that an effective way of harming the German war effort is to bomb the railway lines. The Germans had a very long supply line to the Eastern Front. They were still fighting 
against Russia. And the Allies concentrated on bombing the railway lines to stop rail traffic resupplying the soldiers on the Eastern Front. And the Germans used us to repair the damage caused by the bombing raids on these lines, which meant that we had to rip up the bomb damage sections of the lines. The Germans brought by train replacement railway lines, which we had to unload and carry to the site where it was required. And there another team would put them down. You, you, you know the layout of railway lines. There are things called sleepers, the cross section. Mm -hmm. And then they have to be carefully leveled and then the railway lines are secured on that. And that is the work we had to do. And there were almost nightly raid, bombing raids, so we never ran out of work. In fact, occasionally, there were even daytime raids. While we were working there, uh, bombers would appear and bomb the railway lines. They never aimed at us. They would always do uh, sections which were undamaged, that would concentrate on damaging, while we were repairing these. So it was an unending sort of game of war. They would bomb the lines and we were used to repair the lines. How old were you at this point? I was then 13 years old. And how tall? Pardon? How tall were you? How? Tall. How tall were you? How tall? I don't know, but I, I was always quite big and strong for my age, which came me in good stead. A matter of principle with the Germans was that as long as you could provide value for, for their effort to keep you alive, your life was reasonably safe. But if you weakened and couldn't do the day's work that was expected from you, then um, that bo the things were not uh, boding well for you, because quite frequently people would just quietly disappear. When people began to feel ill or weak or looked haggard, um, they were just quietly taken aside and eliminate, you know, uh, killed without fanfare. And that, that is uh, how, how things happened on, on a daily basis. It was a matter of uh, surviving each day. Each day was a struggle to survive. Not so much a struggle as a, a lottery. You never knew for sure whether you would live to see the end of that day. Because life was very cheap, Jewish life anyway, in the camps. The Germans had free license. If anyone lost their temper and killed a Jew, there were no consequences. What did um, your brother and all the other um, younger children do? Well, it, it was a very, very, very tragic. Um, Incident, well, incident is actually the wrong word because it minimizes it was a tragedy. We had been in the camp only about four, four or five weeks when each day we went to work, these few young children were allowed to remain in the camp. Unlike the Riga ghetto, I was not there to keep an eye on my brother, I was out working. And when we returned from work, we would be reunited. One day after about five weeks there, we came home from work and these four children who were daily awaiting our return were not there. We searched the camp, could not find them, and eventually we were told by one of the kitchen staff, the only other inmates who were in the camp during the day were some people working in the kitchen, because unlike the Riga ghetto, at this camp, they would actually cook us a meal for the evening and when we returned from work we would have to line up and we were each given a tin can. We had to line up tin can in hand and when we reached the front of the queue we had to recite our number 56478, hold out our tin can and we would get a ladle of some soup they had prepared for us. And 
these kitchen staff were the only people in the camp during the day. And one of them told us that during that day, uh, a truck had pulled up, some SS men had said they had orders to pick up the children in the camp, and they loaded these four kids onto the back of the truck and took them away. And despite our efforts, which have extended over the last 70 years because we have not given up, whenever there's an opportunity to contact the search organization, we have done so. In fact, Safta and I, on a trip to America, we went to Salt Lake City specifically because it's the Mormon headquarters and we were told that the Mormons have a lot of information on uh, sort of Jewish archives during the war. And we, we, we actually traveled to Salt Lake City and made inquiries at the Mormon headquarters. They looked through their archives and even they could not find any trace. Ironically, that each time we ask someone to help us and search for any information on my brother, they always come back with information on me. There appears to be remarkably detailed information. If, if you wanted to, if you did a search, you, would, you could find out when I was transferred from Camp A to Camp B. There are records in the German archives, but my brother disappeared without trace on the day that he was taken from this labor camp called Prechu. There's just no trace. And the Germans were normally pretty methodical of keeping records, even of people who were murdered, that they made a note of the dates they were murdered, but nothing, absolutely nothing. We do not know what happened. I mean, we can surmise, but we do not know. There you have the tragic story of my brother. On your list you wrote down the date of when everyone's heads were shaven. Why did you think this was notable to write down at the time? I see. Well, when, when I thought about writing down these um, various key dates, I concentrated, A, on, on the, the few dates I remembered, these dates somehow stuck in my mind. And in this second camp, Prechu, it was strictly a labor camp. And we arrived there in August 43. And apart from the tragic disappearance of my brother, um, it was a daily routine which carried on for weeks and weeks and months at a time. So, I mean, it's silly to say there was nothing noteworthy because each day was a lottery. People did disappear, but on an individual basis, when people could no longer cope or became too weak because we were all underfed all the time, Incidentally, um, it was not possible to supplement one's food because the Germans had issued a proclamation that no food was allowed to be brought into the camp. And if anyone was caught hiding any food on their person, um, they would immediately be shot. And the Germans meant it. I actually saw one lady being taken aside and shot publicly because some food was found concealed on her body. And the way the Germans enforced it is that when these groups came back from working in town, as they entered through the gate, one or two people were taken aside randomly and the body searched. And if anything was found concealed on their person, that, that was the end of their lives. The Germans were not kidding when they said the punishment was death. People paid with their lives for bringing in a few slices of bread, maybe to supplement uh, the, their meagre rations. And the only notes I made was of days when the daily routine was broken. And the days when we had our heads shaved were one of those because it was a day when we were not allowed to go to work. 
the normal routine was to get up early, assemble, be given this chunk of bread and a hot drink, and then off to work, do a day's work, come back, queue for your evening ladle of uh, soup. And believe it or not, our evenings, I remember distinctly in this camp, I spent my evenings on a nightly routine. A friend of mine and I would um, help each other catch the lice and bugs on our bodies because of the lack of hygiene. We were infested with lice and you cannot catch lice on yourselves because they're quite um, sort of fast-moving creatures. That they jump. So I caught lice on, on, in, on his head and that they concentrate on living on, in, in the hair. Um, he caught the lice on my head and I would catch the lice on his head. Going back to the head shaving, Saba, can you describe what happened and then where did you go after that? Well, after the tragic disappearance of my brother, things developed, sort of stayed at a daily routine. It became really quite relatively uneventful, which from our point of view was good because we felt sort of relatively at ease. We knew as long as we did our day's work, we seemed relatively safe. We were allowed to come back. We spent our nights on these bunk beds being plagued by bed bugs, but uh, at least we, we had some rest. And it, it became a daily routine, as I said. Then, after several months of this, one morning we were told no one going to work and eventually we were told that the ladies, the, the women would go to work but all the men had to stay in the camp. Now th this was terrible news for us because we had a feeling uh, we might be being sent away which meant we would be separated from my mother. My mother had to go to work and my uh, my little brother had disappeared, but I had to stay in the camp. But in the event, what they did was um, take us into a large hall which had been arranged as a sort of giant barber shop. That there were lots of um, men there with clippers, and we each had to sit down with one of them, and they just shaved our heads took off every single hair of our heads. And the process was repeated a week or so later <clears throat> for the ladies, it was reversed. The men could go to work that day and the women had to stay in and all the women's heads were shaved. Heaven knows what motivated them. It's unlikely that they did it in order to ease life for us because I suppose lice were less likely to reside on shaved heads than when they could uh, hide and feed in our hair. I think it was much more likely that their motivation was again to sort of take away the last vestige of uh, humanity from us. That I think as well as the daily exploitation of our labour was really the Germans um, goal and I imagine that was their primary motivation. To dehumanize us. But that was not the end of our problems. We went, continued going to work with our shaved heads, but within a few weeks, very few weeks, I have a note here saying it was the shaving took place um, May and June. Then in July, 28th of July, I have a note. Yet another order came that this day no one is to go to work. We all had to stay on assembly in the morning. And after a while, we were separated into men and women and we were led, as we had been in Riga years earlier, into a hall. At the front stood an SS man on a podium he held a little baton like conductors have and as we entered the hall 
there was one major difference between this one and the one in Riga, and that is that this time round we had to strip naked and we had to move forward in single file naked, appearing before this SS man who would look us up and down and usually wordlessly point one way or the other, left or right. One thing I do remember is that as I was shuffling forward, of course I was separated from my mother, she had been with the ladies and I was with the, on my own as a 14 year old, the man next to me whispered into my ear, if he asks you your age, tell him you're 17. He asked me how old I was, I said I'm 14. He said, if you're asked, say you're 17. Well, I was shuffling forward and he must have been prescient. As I stood there in front of this SS man, he asked me, how old are you? And I did as I was told, I said 17. I was, as I said, always fairly big and strong for my age, but I don't suppose I looked 17. But I said 17 and he pointed me to the right, which usually meant to live. And it, of course, soon became apparent that all the elderly, disabled, there were, there were not many disabled people, they had been selected before now, but people who had weakened or become ill since, they were all pointed in the wrong direction. And unlike Riga, people were no longer naive. In Riga, when they had been told they would be sent to a camp where they had to work less hard, people believed it. But this time round, people knew better. We had been through years of experience with the Germans and, and knew that if you couldn't deliver a day's work, um, they had no use for you and you were on the list to be killed. So people who were sent to the wrong side knew what their fate was going to be. Well, after the men had been selected, the ladies' turn came. They also had to strip naked and he looked each one up and down. And when my mother's turn came, she was pointed onto the condemned side. I didn't know at the time because after selection, we had to leave the hall and assemble outside, still naked. It was not winter, this was July, so it, the season was around summer. So naked, we stood outside. There was a large group of people who were selected onto the good side, allowed to live, and a smaller group, but swelling group, on the, on, on the left. And I saw my mother appear on the left, heartbroken. I was on one side, she was on the other. But as I told you, people were no longer naive. And the people who had been selected to the left, as I said, knew what their fate was intended to be. And quite suddenly, there was a swell of people surging from the left. We were not far apart, across to try and disappear, sort of mingle with the people who had been allowed to, to live. And my mother, of course, was among them. There were guards around, guarding the two groups, and of course they intervened as quickly as they could and tried to select people and schlep people back onto the condemned side. And my mother, thank God, managed to merge into this group and they, they did not recognize her and she stayed on that side. And uh, it was uh, in this fortuitous uh, manner that my mother and I were reunited. She was actually condemned at this selection to die and I was uh, selected to live, but she managed to rejoin me. And this is how we stayed together. We were still naked and we thought we would now be able to move back into the hall and dress ourselves, but no. Instead, we were given the convict type clothing, you know, the striped uniforms, and we each had to dress ourselves. 
in one of these uh, uniforms and that remained our outfit until the end of the war. We, when we were liberated, we were still wearing these same stripes. They were never changed. We had to wear it day after day after day from July 1944 until the end of the war, until we were liberated. They were never washed, never cleaned, never changed. And um, that, that was life. Within a couple of weeks, our life changed yet again. What was the selection of Paul and what happened next? Well, the day after our selection, we went back to work, working on these railway lines. That, that was um, our daily occupation and we had to work really hard. We were under supervision there. There were guards who made sure that we did not slack. And it was only for a matter of days. Our selection was on the 28th of July, as you will see from my note here. And a week later, on the 6th of August, the order again came that we had to stand um, to, at the same morning assembly. And before people were sort of sent off to work, um, around 2,000 of us were selected to stay in the camp. It included my mother, so my mother and I were both held behind while the rest went out to their daily work. And the 2,000 of us were taken again to a nearly nearby railway junction. As you realize, this camp, Preciu, was quite close to a railway line. And this is why we were being used to repair the damaged railway lines. We were local. There we were loaded again into cattle trucks, again not given a destination, and we just moved. I mean, by now it, it was a familiar experience because we had been transported in the same manner from Riga to Preciu, and now it was from Preciu to another unknown destination. After traveling for, I believe, three days, we arrived at our destination, which again was not known to us, but when we were, were unloaded, lined up and marched into another camp, we found that this camp was quite different from the last labor camp. It was much, much larger, also wooden barracks. And it turned out that this was a co our first concentration camp. The first camp we were in was a ghetto, Riga. The second one was a labor camp, Preciu. And this one was officially known as the concentration camp, Stutthof or Stutthof. The difference between a labor camp the, and a concentration camp? Pre uh, Riga was um, also effectively a labor camp. The objective was to labor for the Germans, to help the war effort, minimum cost to the Germans. The cost to the Germans was to house us, to um, guard us, and to feed us minimally, to extract the maximum amount of labor for the minimum amount of food they had to give us. But it was um, a part of a town we lived in. The second one was a purpose-built labor camp, it was put there for one purpose only, and that was to house us while we were working in German factories, helping the German war effort. This concentration camp in Stutthof seemed to have a dual purpose. It was partly, again, to help the German war effort, because they had built factories around the area within a couple of miles of the camp where people were marched out daily to work. And of course, again, some worked in munitions factories. They had to make bullets. Some had to make parts for aeroplanes. Some had to make uniforms, all sorts of um, activities, but all designed to help to assist the Germans. 
in keeping us alive, the one purpose they had was to extract labor to help them win the war. But Stutthof also was partly, at least initially and towards the end of the war, it became totally a, a sort of extermination camp on the lines of Auschwitz. Stutthof was in fact one of the first concentration camps to be built. And I believe when it was built, it did not have a, um, a gas chamber nor a crematorium. But around 1941, they were added to the camp facilities. And it was a lottery. When a group arrived at Auschwitz, a group like us was taken aside and we were registered. There were long tables with inmates sitting behind who took down our details, our not name, our number, and sort of registered us as inmates of Stutthof. Other group were taken straight from the train to the gas chamber, were murdered within an hour of their arrival, and were then burnt in the crematorium. How they decided who was allowed to live and who was murdered immediately, I, I have no idea. But we were registered and to our joy and the envy of the rest of the camp, we were told that out of the 2,000 who were taken there in our group, 300 who had been working on the railways were there in transit only. We were as soon as could be arranged, we were being taken onto another camp because we were considered skilled labor. The Allies um, realized that, that sort of for, for the effort involved that caused maximum damage to the Germans by concentrating on damaging the railway network. So this is what they continued to do and intensify. So the Germans actually needed us by now having worked on the railway lines for about a year. We were considered skilled labor. We were an asset to the Germans. So they didn't want us to be killed in Auschwitz, but to move us on to another spot where they could use our skills to repair the damaged lines. Can you describe your three-day journey to Stuttgart? Yes. I'll tell you, because although it's more than 70 years ago now, the, these memories are pretty remarkably clear in my mind, that they're situations which one just cannot forget, and time does not dim them. I can tell you it was terrifying. We were loaded into cattle trucks, like sardines into a tin. There was no room to, to really sit down, certainly not to lie down or relax. And we traveled in this manner for two days from our camp, Prechu, which we had left, and to an unknown destina destination. We had no idea how long we were going to be locked in there. We were pushed into these trucks, the doors were locked. There was no food available, no drink no toilet facilities, and if anyone needed to go to the toilet, there was a bucket in, in the truck. But if someone wasn't near that bucket, it was more or less impossible to push their way through the crowd. And in any case, uh, it was all public. There was no privacy. And that is how we traveled for two days until the train stopped, the doors were unlocked. We were locked into that truck and we were told to get out. We were formed into a column and marched into our first concentration camp. Until then, we had been in Breccia, which was a labor camp, prior to that in Riga, which was a ghetto, which is more or less a variant on, on a labor camp. But Stutthof was totally different. It, it was a concentration camp I don't know whether that means much to you, but the concentration camp was really more or less an extermination camp. 
that you were worked to death effectively if you were lucky and if you were unlucky you were put to death on arrival and that's precisely what happened in Stuttgart. Some transports when they arrived were immediately taken to the gas chambers and within minutes they were murdered. Others were taken into the camp where we slept in wooden barracks which had um, bunk beds, three high, and we had to sleep two to a bed. There was no regular work routine, unlike the other camps. It was more or less just a matter of surviving as, as long as you could, or as long as you were permitted to. So you didn't do any work in Stuttgart? I did not do any work in Stuttgart, but there were 2,000 of us who arrived in Stuttgart, yeah. and our luck was that we were not taken to the gas chambers, but we were taken into the camp. And a day or so after our arrival, we were told that of that group of 2,000, 300 of us who had experience of repairing bomb-damaged railway lines were scheduled to be moved to another camp. We were in Stuttgart only in transit, and we would be moved to a different camp where we would continue to serve the Germans by using our skill, which we had acquired by working for more than a year on railway lines. And I can tell you that we were the envy of the camp. In fact, attempts were made to, by other inmates who, of influence, Stuttgart was sort of governed internally by, believe it or not, that the inmates, the Germans were in charge, of course, yeah. there were watchtowers with armed soldiers to, to make sure that no one escaped. And internally, the management of the camp was done by the inmates, and the inmates were varied. The, there were the Jew, mainly Jews yeah. who were the bottom of the pile. Then there were political prisoners, also in Stutthof, mm. and then there were homosexuals, and then there were criminals. And of the criminals varied as of the severity of their crime, and there were murderers who were also in, uh, sent to Stutthof. And it was these criminals who were at the top echelon in the camp, and the Jewish people were the bottom of the pile. And when it became known that our group of 300 were lucky enough to be sent on to another camp, which meant that we would leave Stutthof alive, which didn't happen to many people. Usually once you entered Stutthof, you may have stayed alive for a while, but sooner or later um, things would catch up with you. Either you'd lose your strength and you were taken away to be killed, or there were selections uh, and then you were taken away. So, as I said, we were the envy of the camp and some of these people with influence attempted to get people removed from our list of 300 and their names substituted so that they would be able to get out of Stutthof. But it, it is a, a complicated story which I can't go into, but my mother, Olea Shodan, had quite something to do with reversing that process because it was the children they were trying to remove from that list of 300 right. so that we would be left behind in Stutthof and they would take our place because the numbers had to tally. You know, if, if they wanted, say, 290 people to be taken to the next camp, the number had to tally. The Germans were very particular about uh, numbers, which meant if two or three of them wanted to be included, two or three of the children would have to be removed. So it was an act of remarkable um, achievement that we were allowed to leave with the transport. And effectively, we stayed in Stuttgart for just three weeks before we were moved on to our next camp. Did your mother work in Stuttgart? No. By the time we got to Stuttgart, which was in 1944, it was already 
coming towards the end of the war. We didn't know because we had no access to any information. We had no idea how the war was going, whether the Germans were winning, losing, whether the end of the war was near. So we were completely oblivious to all that. But from the German point of view, the Germans were already retreating in 1944 and Stutthof was no longer the organized camp it had been. Um, the, the Germans had built factories close to Stutthof and earlier in the war, most of the inmates were marched out of the camp into these factories to work to help the German war effort. But by 1944, there were still people going to work in these factories, but quite a proportion of inmates in Stutthof were no longer working, which means that it was an aimless existence. We slept in these barracks, as I told you, three tier ba yeah. banks, two in a bed. We had straw for mattresses, which were infested by bed bugs. The food situation was pretty horrific. If we were lucky, um, we were given a slice of bread in the mornings. And not every night, day, but most days, some hot um, soup of some sort in the evening. And in between, um, you just wandered aimlessly around the camp. But there was no possibility of um, obtaining any supplementary food to what we were given. Even those people who worked outside the camp, who might have been able to beg or barter for food, were not allowed to bring it into the camp. The Germans had a rule that when people worked outside the camp, each group coming back had one or two people taken at random for body searches, and if any food was found concealed on them, they paid for it with their lives. So if people who worked outside the camp managed to get any food, <clears throat> possibly by bartering something, yeah. or maybe out of kindness from some person outside the camp, all they could do was eat it themselves, but not bring it in right. to, to maybe share with yeah. a member of their family. On the 26th of August, you left Stuttgart. Where did you go after that? I did, yes. Well, the journey from Stuttgart was very much a replica of the journey to Stuttgart. We were again incarcerated in cattle trucks, not given any destination, not given any food, and we travelled for several days, I believe it was three days, before they allowed us out, and we were marched into another camp, which bore a resemblance to the previous labour camp of Preciu, except it was rather larger. And the very distinctive feature of this labour camp of Stolp was that it was situated near probably one of the most active um, railway junctions that I, I have ever seen. That there were railway lines galore, probably dozens of them, and trains were arriving and leaving non-stop, trains were stopping, wagons were being decoupled, uncoupled, coupled onto other trains, that there was, it was a hive of activity. Mm. It was obviously sort of a major nerve center of the railway system. And as a result, the Allies concentrated on bombing it right. in order to disrupt the German war effort, which meant that our skill of repairing railway lines, bomb damaged railway lines, was of um, great value to the Germans. And we were actually a, a valuable commodity to them. In this labor camp yeah. of, of Stolp, um, again, as, as everywhere else, the Germans had built factories specifically. It was not so much the Germans as German industrial firms like Krupp and IG Farben, who were household names in Germany. What is IG Farben? IG Farben was a commercial enterprise. It was a, a huge firm who were 
paint manufacturers primarily. Yeah. They also right. manufactured chemicals, right. including, believe it or not, the gas which was used to poison, to, to, kill, really? to kill Jews. Yes. Yeah. The Germans perfected um, an extremely efficient way of killing people. In fact, although Stutthof had its own gas chamber, yeah. the gas chamber which the Germans had built in the camp proved inadequate for the numbers they were killing. And what they did was to bring along two of these cattle wagons which were stationed near the gas chamber. They used engineers to fill all the cracks to make it a sealed wagon and they made a hole in the roof. People were herded into this cattle truck and then they would open the lid at the top, drop a canister of this poison gas into the cattle wagon and then seal it and just let it take its course. And I think it didn't take more than two or three minutes because people had to breathe and they yeah. had to breathe in these poisonous fumes. And in a matter of minutes, every person in, in that cattle wagon was um, killed, murdered. And this was in Stuttgart. And IG Farben was one of the manufacturers of this poison gas. And it would not be surprising if Jews actually had to help in the manufacture of the gas which that killed, killed. That, that killed them. So in Stolp you were fixing railway lines? In Stolp our group was again set to work on the railways and the air raids were unending. We couldn't repair the railway lines fast enough, yeah. but of course it didn't immobilize the junction totally. Although there was heavy bombing, they still managed to keep trains running, but it, it certainly um, slowed things down. And the Allies, of course, aimed at um, stopping the Germans reinforcing the, the, their troops or resupplying their troops. There were really two groups of us working. My mother was in a group which was detailed to rip up the damaged rails right. and replace them. And the second group had to carry all the new equipment, the rails and uh, the, the auxiliaries. How the, old were you at this point? I was 14 wow. then. And I was part of a team which had to schlep the rails. They were very long and heavy steel rails, which weighed, I don't know how many hundred weight. So six or seven of us had to sort of coordinate and actually sort of heave the thing onto our shoulders and then carry it quite some distance to where, where the, the bombing raid had taken place and the, the equipment was needed. And the Germans, Partly, I suppose, because they didn't want to leave us unguarded along this uh, stretch of, um, sort of the area b between where we picked up the railway lines and uh, they were needed. Yeah. There were stationed German soldiers to guard us. And believe it or not, for a sport, they would arm themselves with wooden sticks into which they had hammered nails at the far end. And as we went by, they lashed out at us to well, encourage us to, to run instead of walking with this heavy load of uh, rail line on our shoulders. And if we weren't fast enough for their liking, they would really lash out and hurt us. I think I may have shown you before. I've, I, I, was, I was caught by a nail once and I've got, yeah. um, can you see, yeah, a scar on my finger. And I think there's a little scar here as well. No, it's but I, I got away very lightly. Many people were hurt yeah. much more severely. The one horrific event I remember about Stolp, where we spent around six months, is that the Germans had issued an order that forbidding people to interfere with any of the rail traffic because there were rumors yeah. in the camp that some of these wagons, which were sealed, contained food. And of course, as the war went on, 
our starvation became greater because the Germans really Starving. found it harder to feed us. They worked us as hard as ever and fed us less than ever. So people were really desperate for, for any scrap of food. And the Germans threatened that if these wagons are interfered with, there'll be death. Nevertheless, one night, a group of men managed to force open one of these wagons and indeed there was food there and of course they stole food out of sheer hunger, starvation. The Germans, of course, were furious at this happening and the next morning they entered the camp and started interrogating and searching and I have no idea whether they actually found the culprits or whether they just in retaliation took away eight men from the camp and following that there was a, a team delegated, believe it or not, to build a huge gallows in the camp in Stolp and a couple of weeks or so later after this gallows was finished and erected there came a day when we were stopped from going to work we all had to assemble in the square where the gallows stood and we had to watch the spectacle of these eight men being led in one by one and hanged on, on this huge gallows. And they forced us to watch by having patrols of German guards mingling with us and if they caught anyone closing their eyes or looking away, you were actually sort of buttered with a gun and they threatened that if you don't look, you'll be the next one up there. They forced us to actually watch these eight men being hanged. This is one of the most graphic memories I have because I obeyed orders and actually watched it happening. And one of these eight was actually a teenager. He was 18 and he, he was sort of a, not, not so much a friend, but an acquaintance of mine. I, I was so vaguely friendly with him in the camp and never he, he, lost, he lost his life on that day together with seven others. That was Stolp. I was at some point during our stint there transferred from this team carrying the rails to work in a little foundry which was also within the camp. And this foundry had to manufacture special one-off bits that were needed for the repairs of the railway lines. Yeah. And as everywhere else, we were guarded by Germans. I learned how to handle the, the red-hot iron. You know, you probably have a picture of what the foundry is like. There was an anvil and sticks of iron yeah. were stuck into a fire until it was white hot. And then we had to take it out with tongues and hammer it into the shape that was required. And I, I became quite skilled at that. And one day, one of the German guards sidled up to me and whispered to me, I should look into this drawer he pointed at. And when I did, when I had an opportunity, I found he'd left me a sandwich. It was, it was an extraordinary act of kindness by a German guard of all people. And he repeated that two or three times. And of course, I, I was ever so grateful. Yeah. And one day he sidled up to me and he said, I see you're quite good at working with this metal. Mm. Um, I would like you to make me a little pocket knife. I was dumbfounded. I had never done anything like that before. I had been trained to do what was needed for the right. railway lines. But I sort of knew. I was quite skilled by then right. handling the stuff. And I, I made him, I, I couldn't refuse him, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I made him... This was, of course, illegal. I wasn't allowed to do anything that I wasn't instructed to do. Mm -hmm. But I, I managed 
to, to make a little blade, sharpen it, polish it, and I made him a little pocket knife. It, it, it actually worked, but a blade, a retractable blade, which you could close and open. And when it was done, I, I gave it to him, and he fed me several sandwiches. Wow. And then one day he had gone. Uh, yes. I never saw him again. I don't know what his motivation was, but, but um, he wasn't allowed to ask me to make him a pocket knife. He wasn't allowed to give me a sandwich. I wasn't allowed to manufacture the pocket knife, but, but thank God we, we got away with it all. And it helped sustain me just a wee bit. Um, by this point, it was already 1945 and the Germans were clearly losing the war, but they weren't giving up. But what did they do after Stop? Well, they may have been, I'm sure that they were aware that they were losing the war, but yeah. we were not. We were totally insulated and isolated in our camp. We had no access to any outside information. Okay. There were no newspapers, no radios, nothing at all. So all the people we were in contact with were fellow inmates who had also been in the camps for years and didn't know. So when the order came that we were being sent to yet another camp, to us, it was just an endless experience. We had no idea what was in store for us. Right. There was yet another cattle truck journey. We were unloaded and we found we were in a quite small labor camp, which again was situated near a railway junction. And more or less on, on, on the f second day or so after we arrived in Bulgraben, yeah. there was still every morning this assembly where the Germans would come along and count us to make sure that there were the same number of people that they, as they expected to be. And during the first assembly, this SS man who was walking along, looking and counting us, stopped in front of me and gazed at me more or less interminably. Internally, I, I really was terrified mm -hmm. because to be noticed was bad news yeah. in the camps. And then he beckoned me to come forward. I had no idea what was in store for me. I didn't quite say Shema, but it, it more or less looked like this was the end of me. Yeah. But what he did, he said to me, I'm going to appoint you as my valet. When everyone else goes, you stay here and I'll show you what I want you to do. And that's what happened. He took me to his living quarters and told me that from now on I was to make his bed, I was to wash his breakfast things, I was to clear up his, his um, room. Mm. And I had to do my very best, of course, because right. it was in his power to do whatever he wanted with me. Yeah. If he'd pulled his gun and, and shot me, there would have been no consequences for him. So, of course, I, I did the very best I could. And in the course of cleaning his place, I found that he was a pipe smoker and there were numerous packets of tobacco lying around, opened. I don't know what motivated me. I was basically an, an honest person, but in this situation, I thought he won't notice a bit of tobacco missing and you never know, it, it might be come in handy at some point. So I started taking bits of tobacco out of various started packets, hid it on my body and took it back into the camps. And I did that for the number of days while I was working for him. We had been in the camp for only two weeks when the order came yet again, we we're leaving. And we were put into cattle trucks, taken away again. We still, my mother and I were in the camp together. I gave her the tobacco and she hid it on her person. And we were yet again by cattle truck transported to an unknown destination, right. which to our horror was Stutthof for a second time. We were back in this concentration camp and this time we were not told that we were in transit, but um, just, just inmates of Stutthof, which normally was more or less a death sentence. It was just a question of how long one would last in Stutthof. So that, that was our experience towards 
what proved to be the end of the war, but we had no idea that the end was near. And at the end of the war, when you left Stuttgart, where did you go after that? Where did the Germans take Well, it wasn't the end of the war. We were in Stuttgart, as you can see here, if you look at it, we arrived in Stuttgart on the 21st of March, 45, mm -hmm. and we were in Stuttgart, we, we open-endedly, we had no idea, but on the 26th of April, which is so five weeks or so after right. we arrived, the order came one morning, they, they just came into the barracks and said, right. right, the inmates of this barrack just come out and stand here. And likewise, in the women's camp, my mother and I in Stutthof were not in the same camp. There was a men's and a women's camp adjoining, but separated by barbed wire. In the ladies' camp, the same thing happened. Ladies were taken out, assembled, and eventually this group, which numbered a total of around 5,000, were each given half a loaf of bread and we were told to march. There was this enormous column of around 5,000 people being marched out of the camp. We had to march for the best part of a day when we, in the afternoon, ended up in a small harbour. I have no idea where we were, what it was called. And in this harbour, at the edge, moored, were four barges. Yes. Quite old, old-fashioned barges made of wood. And the fact that they were made of wood um, is significant, as you'll find out in a moment. They mar uh, loaded us onto these four barges, which meant there were more than a thousand people per barge. Yes. And these were not motorized. These were just like shells with an open interior. They were used for transporting coal right. or steel or timber, just large open spaces. And we were put into this open space, a thousand of us, more than a thousand, packed into each barge. And then four tugs appeared, which coupled themselves one onto each barge. And this convoy of four vehicles, you know, four boats, set off into the sea. We had not any notion of where they were taking us, what our fate would be. People started speculating and thought they were just towing us into the, the deep part of the ocean. And then they would pull a plug and allow us to sink, to get rid of us. We, we just didn't know, no one told us. But when we had been traveling for half a day, the convoy stopped. A German officer transferred from the tug yes. onto the barge. He sort of walked around the top walkway, looking down into the hold where he saw a thousand plus of us packed like sardines again. And he selected six youngish men who he sort of saw from looking down. And these six men were then told that they were under his orders and whatever he asked them to do, they had to obey orders. He then looked around, pointed at one person and extraordinarily, it, he, he seemed to fasten on a particular person that they weren't quite clear who he meant. I mean, they went up to the wrong person. They said, no, no, not that one, it, this one, the one with the ginger hair. And they had to get hold of that person. He said, now you take him and bring him up to me. And they had to grab this person between the six of them and sort of win their way, which was difficult. They had to step over bodies. We were all lying there and had to take them up to, to a staircase where they had to schlep them up onto the top. And as soon as they reached the top, we couldn't see what was happening once they reached the end of the barge, but we heard a splash and a scream. And this person who had been selected was just thrown live into the water. And that was not the end of it. They were told to come down again. He selected a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth victim. 
and he selected more than 20 people, I think it was around 25 people, who in turn, each of them had to be dragged up. Once we heard the splash, people knew what was in store. And of course, when they got hold of this victim, they struggled and screamed, but to no avail, they were taken up and splash into the water. And 20, 25 or so people were murdered in this fashion. Then he went back to his tug and we were set in motion, we, we moved on. We traveled in this manner for six days and each day they stopped, he came over and he selected his number of victims to be killed in the same cruel manner. Sam, I had some questions for you. Yes. After going through what you went through, which everyone else has spoken to you about, all the atrocities, how you managed to rebuild your life and build such a splendid family and build a life for yourself when lots of people, when lots of other people didn't manage to. You managed to put yourself through school to study everything, to study everything you studied and to build a life. Saying, not just me, people I've spoken to and friends and, and last time I brought a friend who came to hear you speak as well. I was also very, very impressed by that. Yes. Well, I, I'm prepared to admit to you that it required willpower on my part, but in addition, unlike many other survivors, I was extraordinarily fortunate in that at the end of the war, I had parents. The vast majority of my friends who are Holocaust survivors survived as orphans, that they lost their family, including parents, and they had to start life afresh, on their, totally on their own. I was remarkably lucky that, firstly, right through the war, each time we were moved from one camp to another, it was both my mother and I who were moved together. We could so easily have been separated and moved to different camps, or one of us selected for, for murder and the other one survived. Both of us survived. And although my mother was pretty powerless, nevertheless, she did all she could to sort of shield me and support me and although my father was a pauper, practically had not two pennies to his name, nevertheless, we were a family, a loving family. I'm sure as well I've spent uh, the most amount of time with you, and it's been the hours we spent preparing for my bar mitzvah 13, uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Here in Israel, every time you come, you're also strict with me uh, in a good way. Has, has helped me a lot. Uh, one thing that that has stuck with me, and that was to where when things are tough, um, even if it was not necessarily in the regular day-to-day, -day, for example, here in the army, or just living here with a situation that's going on day-to-day, -day, one of the things so I might have thought about or spoken about with friends is what we're going through is nothing compared to what you and the other millions went through a younger age and a lot more difficult. Something that has helped, helped in a way to get through, get through times. What message would you would you give to the to the young generation of today, especially the generation who who do know about the Holocaust, who don't understand, don't understand the Holocaust, don't understand what people went through. What's the message that you, you want to pass on and make sure continues? It has taught me that you can only really live your life meaningfully by having faith. All of us, at some point in our lives, feel that we are experiencing things we don't deserve to when things go wrong, um, we become resentful and begin to doubt that the 
justice from above uh, will see us through. I find or found in my life and still do today that whatever happens to us, if one does not lose faith, one will begin to see light at the end of a tunnel. Ne never give up. I can't wait to see you again personally, but this is lovely. We must Maybe. do this again. We will. Anne Frank wrote in her diary that even after all that she'd been through, she still believed that people, well, that the people are intrinsically good at heart. Do you have anything, do you agree with that? Or do you think that some people are just intrinsically bad or evil? Well, overall, as you well know, I experienced unbelievable and indescribable cruelty for almost four years in the camps. And even prior to that in Germany, we were unjustly being discriminated against. But I firmly believe that there are still many, many good and kind people around. The one experience I spoke about, this German soldier, this was something unbelievable. A, soldier, a man in German uniform who is on duty to watch us and presumably if ordered to do so, to kill us, mm -hmm. indicates to me that he's prepared a sandwich for me. It is, it's almost beyond belief. Likewise, when we have gone to Yad Vashem, we see that many thousands of non-Jews during the war literally risked their lives hiding Jews and helping Jews. And each one of these did it knowing that if they were caught, they were likely either to be sent to a concentration camp themselves, or worse than that, they might have been killed, shot by the Germans for being traitors. I think Generation to Generation is such an important project because it will educate the younger people, especially as we have less Holocaust survivors around. Um, and growing up with you as a grandfather suburb has been such a humbling and inspiring childhood because it's really taught me to appreciate everything I've had, especially um, my schooling and my education and not taking anything I have for granted. Um, and you're just such a role model and someone who I really, really look up to, so thank you. Well, you make me feel proud of you, Abigail. Oh. If I've managed to be a positive influence on any of your lives, then all I can say is thank God. Saba, thank you so much for letting us interview, today, interview you today because I know it must have been really hard for you. Um, but it's so inspiring and so humbling to hear your story and I think that this interview will be so accessible to the younger generation and it's important um, for people to see it and for it to be documented. It mm. couldn't have been easy for you to, to listen to these horrors just as it's not that easy for me to speak about them but I feel we are in a sense discharging a duty to future generations here in enabling them to actually almost witness a first-hand account of what actually happened. And in addition to all that, of course, this is the answer to any Holocaust deniers of whom there's no shortage. And I'm quite sure in the future, um, that there will be more than there are now. But this is the evidence which will actually prove them to be the despicable liars they are. And therefore, it's well worth making the effort. None of us found it easy today, but I feel that the end result is worth all the effort we had to put into making it happen. I'm full of admiration for the effort and time and thought you ladies have put into setting this up.